Finance Committee to order for September 4th, 2024. Madam Clerk, will you call roll? Or Ms. Wendell. <laughs> Thank you. We have all assembly members present in chambers besides assembly member Wall, who is present on Zoom, and assembly members Wahal Gadak and Bryson, who are absent. Thank you, Ms. Wendell. Um, and any changes or additions, deletions to the minutes on June 5th, 2024? Seeing none, we'll consider those minutes approved. Moving on to agenda topics, investment update. Ms. Madam Finance Director. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, tonight we'll have a brief overview of our, in, our main investment portfolio from um, David Whitholm. He's with Investment Insight and as part of our um, investment managers. Um, this In your packet, you have lots and lots of material. He's not going to cover every slide, but we will um, keep up with him. And I see, Dave, that you are there. So welcome, and the floor is yours. Uh, well, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. You can. Okay, great. Um, uh, first, let me say I, I, I did attempt to come up and vi visit with you in person on uh, in August, but, uh, you know, the floods uh, prevented that. And I'm sorry about the floods, and I know that's terrible news. Uh, but uh, I will say that the portfolio has some good news to it. So uh, with that, let's proceed and if we can move down to slide number five, I'll tell you a little bit about what's going on with the market and, the, and what's going on with the portfolio. All right, thank you. All right, so these are what we call yield curves. And all that is is just a graphic representation of the interest rate different maturities are paying. And so across the bottom, uh, you have uh, three months, six months, one year, two year, all the way out to 10 year treasuries. And then you have the interest rates. Each one of those particular bonds are paying at the time. And this is a historic yield curve. So uh, the dotted line is, is where uh, interest rates were uh, back in the end of July in uh, 2023. And the solid green line is where they were at the end of July uh, uh, just this year. And as you can see, rates have dropped, but it, the news is continues because even now a month later, um, that three month uh, a treasury is down now paying 507. Uh, the two year treasury is now paying 380. Uh, the five year is paying 360. So it's down 31 basis points. And the 10 year is currently paying about 380. So it's down 16 basis points. So the whole yield curve just continues to shift lower. And that's in anticipation of the Federal Reserve that they're going to start dropping interest rates because of a couple of things that are happening in the economy. And, and let's move on to the next slide to talk a little bit about that. With this slide, this is just called an economic surprise slide. So it it is, how the economic numbers came out as opposed to how they were predicted to come out. And in, it went in the blue shaded area, uh, they were on a surprise to the upside. In the green shaded area, they were on a surprise to the downside. And all last year, all the economic numbers kept coming in as a surprise to the upside. But in the first part of this year, it turned a little bit south. And they started, the economic numbers started to come out as a surprise to the downside. And so people thought the economy started to get a little bit weaker because this economy was very strong running uh, when we measured it by GDP, which is the broadest measure of economic activity last year. It was running at 2.5%. And keep in mind, before the pandemic, the long run average, the 10 year average for GDP growth was running about 2%. So last year was a pretty good year. Um, the first quarter GDP numbers came out this year and they were at 1.4%, which everyone was concerned about. But the third, the second quarter numbers came out and they were running at 3% GDP growth. So if you average the two, you were at 2.2% GDP growth. Yes, down a little bit from the 2.5% growth rate from last year, but you know, 
over the long-term average of the 10-year average. So the economic growth across the country looks pretty good and it's expected to uh, continue on for the next, uh, the remainder of this year and then slow a little bit more in 2025. So in general, economic growth has been pretty good, which no one predicted because the Federal Reserve was trying to slow down inflation. And to do that, they generally have to slow down the economy. And yes, the economy slowed slightly, but we haven't gone into a recession. So that's the basic soft landing that everyone said couldn't happen and that the Federal Reserve couldn't pull off. Uh, but in fact, they have pulled that off. Let's go down to the next slide. One of the things that has been moderating is the unemployment rate. Uh, during the pandemic, the, the unemployment rate dropped to 3.4%, which was a 50-year low. So that was very low unemployment. But right now, it's been rising a little bit, and it's now at 4.3%. So yes, that's up from the 50 year lows, but decades ago, when I went to school, they taught us that, you know, frictional unemployment runs around 5%. So that the natural level of unemployment should be around 5%. And again, it's at 4.3 now. It's going to rise over the next few months. And by the end of the year, it's gonna be at least at four and a half percent, if not a little bit higher but it's really raising towards that long-term average, which is about 5%. And all this graph is showing you is that the unemployment in the past has been far greater than 4.3% where it is now. And if you take it relative to the number of job openings that are still out there in the economy, the ratio of job openings to unemployment unemployed people is about 1.1. So there's actually slightly more job openings than there are people unemployed, which means that the economy is pretty much in balance. Now, the Federal Reserve is concerned that if the economy slows down anymore, then there'll be more unemployment and the, Fed and the employment situation will get out of balance. So they're moderated inflation, and we're going to look at that on the next slide, but they have to also keep in mind that if they slow the economy too much, they're going to put too many people out of work. Right now, that's not happening, but it's starting to rise a little bit, and that's an area that we have to have of concern. Let's go down to the next slide. Um, the Fed's preferred measure of inflation which is called PCE. A lot of people think of CPI, which is the consumer price index, but the Fed prefers a different measure. It's called PCE, personal consumption expenditures, slightly different makeup, uh, but that has been running at 2.5%. Um, so that's the rate of growth of inflation. Now, it doesn't count for all the inflation that's gone in the past, all it's saying is that the current rate of growth is only at about two and a half percent. And the Fed's goal is to get that rate of, in, of inflation growth to be around two percent. Well, we, it's been a long time since we've been at two percent, at least four years. Um, so uh, and the core number, which is without food and energy, because those are the most volatile components, is running at about two point six percent. So look, we're currently above the Fed's target. But as you can see, the inflation has been coming down. It's not a straight line down. It's a jagged line down. But it's generally been coming down for the last couple of years. And the Fed is pretty sure that it's going to come down uh, over the next couple of months. And in fact, if you look at the three months, the last three months, and say, what's the average inflation rate for the last three months, and then annualize that rate, it's only running at 1.7%. So all they have to do is keep at this current level of inflation and they're going to meet their target. So they're pretty darn happy about that. And they're, therefore, they feel like they can start to, they had raised interest rates to slow the economy, to slow inflation. And now they feel like 
they can start cutting back on those interest rates and lowering those interest rates so that they can spur the economy and, and keep those employment numbers from getting the unemployment numbers from getting too, too high and keep a, a lot of people in the economy employed. So uh, that's been uh, their goal and they, they seem to be reaching it, uh, lowering inflation while still keeping the economy going and still keeping unemployment at a, at least a reasonable level. Uh, let's drop down to the next slide. This is the only really cloud on the horizon Consumers are still spending, and you see that in credit card debt. Um, they don't have a lot of uh, savings that they had during the pandemic when they got all those stimulus checks. But now they're spending, and a lot of their some of their spending is, is at least on credit cards. And of course, credit card delinquencies have been going up along with credit card use. So that's kind of a black cloud on on the future and saying, well, you know, how long can this economy uh, keep with consumer spending if credit levels are getting so darn high. And that's something we're going to have to keep an eye on. But right now, it doesn't seem like it's slowing the economy down at all because consumers are still spending. Just one more slide. We throw this in uh, just as a reminder because interest payments on the U.S. government federal debt are now the third largest expenditure greater than national defense, greater than income security and veterans benefits, almost as much as we spend on Medicare or social security. So it's getting up there and that's gonna be a concern if we continue to increase the deficit spending that we've been doing over the last decade. So we have to stop that at some point. Uh, otherwise, you know, our credit uh, ratings will start to deteriorate. Uh, on the national and federal level. Finally, let's do a summary slide. Just to kind of give you our ideas, in 2023, uh, the Fed's policy rate, uh, the overnight funds rate by the Federal Reserve was at four or 540. We expect that by the end of the year to come down at least 75 basis points and maybe 100 basis points. And again, a basis point is one hundredth of 1%. So we expect it to, to drop about three quarters of a percent to 1% between now and the end of the year. The, the Fed's meeting, they've got three meetings between now and the end of the year. The next meeting is on uh, September 18th. So just two weeks away, they are certainly going to cut interest rates uh, on the overnight rate at that meeting, uh, our guess is about 25 basis points and probably 20, at least 25 basis points at the next two meetings. But there may be a surprise. They may cut it by 50 basis points in one of these meetings if you start to see that unemployment rate tick up even more. Uh, here we talk about the consumer price index. They think it's going to be down at 3.1%. It's actually already at 3%. So even our federal, our economist is a little wrong. He's behind on his guesses on this. And it's probably the, the CPI is going to be lower than 3% by the end uh, of 2024. And real GDP, he's got to pay, is running at 2.2% average right now for the first half of the year. It may pick up a little bit. So he his 2.4% estimate <clears throat> may be on target. Um, he may not be too far from that. But note that he has it slowing down in 2025 again to right around that 2% average level. And also note that between where interest rates end at the end of 24, uh, his estimate is that overnight rates are going to drop at least another 1%. Uh, in 2025. I think he may be behind uh, the ball on a little bit on that, and it may drop even a little bit more. Uh, he'll probably revise his estimate by the end of the year. That's what economists do. They always have that purview. So with that, let's turn on to page 13 and talk about the portfolio and the performance. Portfolio performance has been looking pretty good. If you look at the three-month average, we're up about uh, 12 basis points over the benchmark. Uh, year to date, we're at 39 basis points. One year, we're at 49, and three years, we're at 38 basis points. That's performance 
in addition to the benchmark. So that performance looks pretty good over even over an extended period of time. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the portfolio income in, in upcoming slides. So that's that's good news. The portfolio is starting to perform with interest rates coming up and really getting higher over the last couple of years. That allowed us to mature some of the bonds that were purchased during the pandemic down when the interest rates were very, very low. In fact, the two-year treasury was paying 20 basis points for an extended period of time during the pandemic. So now it's been up over 4% for quite a while. So we've had those 20 basis points bonds maturing all the way along, and we're putting 4%ers back into the portfolio. So that helps a lot in terms of portfolio income. Let's drop down another slide, and you can see how the portfolio income, right? this is the market value of the portfolio versus the book value, the market value, even since April has been coming up rather significantly and the market value and the, and the, uh, and the book value are getting very, very close. Now, I, I think the most important is this little breakout that we put in here. Here's the income being generated as of June on an annual basis. As of June 22, we were making 1.8 million. At June 23, we we're making 2.7 million in the portfolio. And as of June of 24, we're at 3.7 million. So as I said, those interest rates hurt us a lot during the pandemic. Uh, they were super low. Uh, the lowest we've seen in, well, I think the lowest I've ever seen. So it was certainly the lowest in 50 years. Um, but now incomes up uh, and the good news is in 2025, I think it's going to be up even higher than it was in 2024. And in 2024, we doubled what it was in 2022. So that's more good news. At some point, it's going to start to moderate because the Federal Reserve is going to start to lower interest rates. Um, and so in, in 2026, I would imagine it start to come down at least a little bit. Um uh, but right now, the good news in the portfolio is we're earning twice as much income on the portfolio as we were two years ago. Let's drop down another slide. Oh, there we are. Just talking about the portfolio, the yield on the portfolio is right at 5.2% versus the benchmark at 4.8%. So the yield on the portfolio is looking pretty good. It's up over 5%. That won't stay there forever as the Federal Reserve starts to lower interest rates over the next year. But it's looking pretty good for now. And um, and there's still a few bonds within the portfolio that are going to wash out of the portfolio uh, that are low yielding bonds. And we're going to be able to put them in at much higher rates. And so the yield to worse should stay uh at least elevated for a while, not forever, but you know it's going to stay up there for a while. The effective duration of the portfolio is 2.4 years. It's slightly shorter than the benchmark. We would love to get that longer than the benchmark. Right now, uh, we're 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 trying to do that between now and the end of the year as the Federal Reserve starts to lower interest rates. We want to get that uh, effective duration up a little longer than the benchmark. Just as far as the ratings, one of the things to notice about the ratings in this portfolio and the portfolio constraints versus the benchmark, the benchmark is allowed to use uh, uh, a much higher percentage of triple B securities, uh, which are triple B corporates. It's it's at about, well, it's 11.7, so say 12% of the benchmark. We're at 1.8, and that's by uh, investment policy. Uh, we don't we aren't allowed to go into some of these lower quality securities that the benchmark uses. So generally, the portfolio, even though it's got better performance than the benchmark, it's actually a little higher quality than the benchmark, too. So um, that's been good. That's good for us. Uh, you know, if there is any kind of economic downturn, that really helps us out uh, rather considerably. Um <clears throat> And let's drop down one more slide. 
and I will talk about the asset allocation. Right now, the biggest holdings in the portfolio are Treasury at 23%, and uh, that's U.S. Treasuries and the agencies at about 22%. So, you know, we that's that's the two largest holdings, and then we have some uh, mortgage pass-throughs, and then we have uh, corporate bonds, uh, uh, which are a lot of them are financial institutions. So, some of your biggest banks in the U.S. Uh, we hold as financial institutions, and that's another 17% of the portfolio. We hold about 11% in industrial uh, bonds as well, and uh, some in utilities. And with that, um, so it's a relatively high-quality portfolio. We don't have a lot of triple B securities. It's generally all A or better, uh, less than 2% are under the triple B uh and uh, I, what is it, 45% of the portfolio is in actually government securities. We have a question for Mr. Smith. Sure, absolutely. Very good, and, and sorry if I jumped the gun and you were gonna explain it. No, I was, no, I, I was all wrapping up. Oh, perfect. I was wondering if you could um, define or, or just let me know what the, what the acronyms, the ABS, CMO, CMBS, what those stand for. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. ABS is asset-backed securities. So these are, uh, they're corporate-like, but they are bonds that are backed with uh, either car loans or credit card loans or some kind of financing. And in general, all of those securities are rated AAA. Um, they bundle all these things together. And even during the great financial crisis, they did exceedingly well um, because of the diversification within those types of bonds. So they're very high quality bonds. They pay a little bit of a spread uh, over regular treasuries and agencies. CMO, collateralized mortgage obligations, are similar to ABS, but it's backed with mortgage obligations or mortgage bonds. And CMBS is commercial mortgage-backed securities. And MBS pass-throughs is regular residential uh, mortgage securities. Again, every one of those is rated AAA. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. As to you, Mr. Whitholm. Go ahead. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, so all those securities are all listed in the holdings section under this presentation. So, um, uh, you know, if you want a little bit more detail, you can look under the ABS section and a lot of times it'll say securitized or something like that. Uh, and there'll be all of those are listed back in that section, but they're all AAA rated. And with that, I, I'll, I'll take any more questions. I, I know we've got some kind of uh, we've got some time constraints, and I'm kind of up against it. But uh, but I'm always open to any questions that you might have, and I look forward to seeing you and and at one of the meetings coming up in the not too distant future. Thank you, uh, Ms. Flick. Thank you, Mr. Holm, for your um, presentation. Um, we we bring our Insight Investment Managers to you um, periodically, at least annually, so that you get a chance to review our overall um, portfolio. Um, the data represented here is not just the general fund. So when we talk about um, interest earnings and gains in this portfolio, they are spread out amongst the various funds um, annually as part of our um, end of year process of um, spreading out the interest earnings. So if there are other questions, um, we can take them. Mr. Smith. Just one last one. Um, do you rate or do, can you give ESG scores for a portfolio? And do you do that? Uh, we do. In fact, we're one of the premier ESG managers in uh, the U.S. Uh, we do it, well, it started because we manage so many portfolios uh, in fixed income portfolios in Europe. And in Europe, you can't manage any portfolios without having every bond uh, with an ESG rating. And 
while we don't present all the ESG ratings here, I will tell you that your portfolio, every security within your portfolio has an ESG rating. Uh, we use a couple of different sources uh, to combine and come up with our own ESG rating, but we have an ESG team that does uh, nothing but compile that. We use MSCI as our primary source, but we use three other sources uh, to come up with ESG scores. And we, we do come up with our own amalgamated score based on uh, all of the information that we take in from outside sources. Um, and uh, it's, ex it's extensive. We have uh, a responsible investing team uh, at Insight. I don't know if you don't know a lot about Insight, but Insight's part of Bank in New York. I mean, we're their investment, we're their fixed income investment advisor. Uh, with uh, uh, almost uh, 900 uh, billion in assets under management. But ESG is one of the specialties. We don't do it for every account. We do it for every security. We have a score, but some accounts would like us to run on an ESG basis and others would not. So uh, yes, we have full ESG capabilities. Mr. Smith, do you have a follow-up? No, thank you, Madam Mayor. Any further questions? Ms. Wall, I don't see a hand. Okay, thank you, Mr. Whithon, for your hard work and uh, giving us this, our good report, and we hope to see you in the near future. And thank you for trying to get here from before. So appreciate your time on this. And with that, we'll say good night, and we'll come back to Ms. Flick. So our next agenda item um, is related to Bartlett. If you're in the packet, it starts at page 43. And um, Madam Manager is going to kind of direct traffic on proceeding through this area. Madam Manager. Thank you, Mayor Weldon and Ms. Flick. Uh, so I think just to try to organize the um, flow of uh, information and assembly action on this item, I'd like to start with a presentation uh, by Finance Director Warner. Um, it's a, that's included in your packet that is a follow-up to the last assembly meeting when we spoke about this. It feels like it was a really long time ago. It was probably about six weeks ago. Um, and there were a number of questions that the assembly had about um, rainforest recovery uh, specifically and some of the, the information there. So I think what we'd like to do is have him give a presentation or I, I'm actually not sure who Bartlett is uh, having present. They've got the cadre of leadership here. So I will let them decide who's presenting. I just know that I've been work, working uh, directly with him. And then uh, there's a memo in your packet that I'd like to walk through potential kind of funding sources and assembly action on this uh, together with Deputy Manager Barr. Um, so that's kind of how we hope to uh, tackle this next agenda item. Perfect. So who's coming up? Who got the short straw? And the presentation starts on page 49 of your packet. Thank you, Ms. Flick. Who's starting? I'm going to take the lead on this one to start it. Um, so yeah, most of this information is just um, in response to some of the questions that came over the first time we came and presented. And so uh, if we want to go to the next slide. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> one more. Um, next slide. <laughs> A lot of this is just our standard deck, so a lot of this stuff comes with it. So the first the first slide I want to go over is just some of the demographics from the population that is served by rainforest recovery. So in the first presentation, we just had the search beneficiaries listed as the population that we're looking at. Um, so what we've pulled is all the demographic information that was readily available in our Meditech system. So as you can see up there, we have 43% uh, females, 57% males. 45% Alaska Natives, 3% Hispanic, 50% Caucasians. Um, the other one I'd like to point out is 38% of the population of the patients is from Juneau, with an additional 20% from the Southeast Alaska. Um, and I was gonna dive into the rest of them unless there's specific questions about some of these demographics that we have up here. Mr. Smith. Sorry, Madam Mayor. Um, I was just looking at that 27% from Anchorage Matsu, and I was 
just curious about that and why they, I mean, anyway, yeah, any, any ideas of why they're coming here for these services? Uh, some of it has to be, it has to do with uh, beds available, I think, in just the state of Alaska. Um, just us being a 3.5 level, we get a lot of those patients. Okay. Thank you. And that has to do with funding, right, that we're taking patients from all over, correct? Okay. I have Mrs. Hale and then Mrs. Hughes-Candies. Thank you, and that's a great follow-up. My question is about that. If if we have a 3.5 service and we have beds available, are we required to take patients from, for example, Matsu Anchorage? I can't answer that question. I might have to kick that one to Yeah, we have beds available. I don't know if there's an actual requirement that we take them. The only requirement, only required service that I know of is the DET, which is the mental health unit. So I don't think we're required to take. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Warner, can you maybe adjust sorry. the mic so that better? it's pointing right to your mouth because I'm having a really hard time hearing you. Is that it? Yeah. Thank you. And so the, we, the only, only service that we provide that we're required to accept patients is the DET, which is our mental health unit, which that's designated evaluation and treatment facility. So we have a special grant funding from the state that requires us to take certain patients throughout the state for that service. Um, there is no requirement for RRC for us to take patients from outside our area that I'm aware of. Okay, so um, I'll ask one more follow-up, please. Follow-up. Thank you. It is a separate question. It is a follow-up. Uh, so related to that, if if Bartlett is losing money in, on RRC and and perhaps the assembly is supposed to provide money to help or is being asked to provide money to help, but we're not required to take patients from other parts of the state. I guess my question, just a philosophical question, is uh, do we need to keep doing that? And I know you can't really answer that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> Ms. Hughes Scandies. Yeah, thanks, Madam Mayor. Uh, thanks for this. I am going to ask uh, in that May meeting, which was feels so long ago, we had a smaller amount of demographics on the patients served at Rainforest Recovery and you are asked several times that night for all of the other components, hospice, home health, um, crisis center maybe, if we had demographics for those components of the hospital. So am I going to see those tonight in Meditech stats? Um, the only stats we were able to pull was for RRC. We didn't. Sorry. You okay. I just want to call attention to that because we had some last time and it was made really abundant for other reasons. Just, you know, there's a political nature to when we show demographics for some things and not for others. So I understand we're talking about rainforest recovery tonight, but I just want to further drive home the point that if we have questions that don't get answered, maybe we want those in the future. Thank you, Ms. hughes Candies. Any further questions before they move on? Go ahead. Next slide. So the second question that was asked of us at the last meeting was to go over the difference between the 3.1 and the 3.5 level of service. And for this, to go over that in a little better detail, I'm actually going to ask that Fred can help us. So Fred works with Gasno Human Services, and he's much more in tune with what the difference is between the two levels of services, if that's okay. Uh, thank you. And Fred, since he didn't give a last name, would you introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Fred Sweetsky. I'm the Director of Behavioral Health at Gasno Human Services. Thank you. Go ahead. So as far as breaking down the difference in the 3.1 and 3.5 levels of care, what we're talking about is the level of intensity or hours of services that clients are getting. The primary difference is that 3.5 services also requires an additional medical component um, where our clients are able to access medical care within the first 72 hours of intake and to have their medical needs addressed uh, upon intake. Other than that, the primary uh, 
I think 3.5 is a minimum of 20 hours per week of structured services provided to the client. 3.1 is a minimum of nine hours and a maximum of 19 hours. So we're just talking about the level of intensity or the amount of hours of structured services that are provided. Both are residential inpatient. I think that um, there's often sometimes confusion about that. Both are residential inpatient services where the client resides on the campus and provides and is provided treatment services by staff on site. Any questions between the two of the 3.1 or the 3.5? All right, thank you. Thank you. So the rest of the slides that we have up here just lays out the detail that about between the 3.1 and 3.5. So they were just provided as informational. They don't, it basically just goes for what Fred provided as a brief summary to the different levels of service. Madam Manager, is that you? We're all looking I, at I, th I think so. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, if there's no more questions for um, Bartlett um, about uh, the reinforced recovery or the difference between 3.1 and 3.5, um, we do have Gasno Human Services here. So thank you for being here to contribute to that conversation because I think it will be valuable as we move forward. I'm on page 43 of your packet which just tries to uh, walk through some additional kind of questions and process from the last time the, uh, the body had talked about this in July. Um, so just to summarize the July meeting, you did introduce, uh, you did refer to the Finance Committee an ordinance to fund the uh, deficit for hospice and home health, which is $386,000. Uh, for fiscal year 25 with no funding source. So this memo talks about different funding sources. I think it's worth noting that um, Bartlett feels, you know, very, uh, in, in their original presentation, it talked about um, the importance of hospice home health and that they were committed to, to providing that service um, and, and making it fiscally sustainable. So, uh, you know, something that they aren't intending on cutting uh, regardless, but have requested CVJ support for that. The other item, uh, was to bring you back uh, information on um, the need for reinforced recovery and uh, proposed funding sources. So if you look here at the table, uh, it's a total of, of $2.15 million. If you <clears throat> were to fund for this, this current fiscal year, home health hospice and reinforced recovery. The, the next item on the agenda just reminds you of all the uh, all the, the fiscal demands on your uh, budget and your fund balance and reminds, uh, reminds us to, to think in the frame of reference of if we're gonna have ongoing um, costs that we need ongoing revenue. So that's our little PSA, public service announcement for that. Uh, then I just wanna explain the table on page 44 a little bit. Um, we were directed to kind of come back with some ideas on potential funding and so um, we did uh, pull the Bartlett uh, fund balances and I will just note that Bartlett uh, thinks of their fund balance differently than we think of our fund balances. So this information is presented, um, you know, based on their operating fund, capital projects and board designated reserves. So those are reserves that they're required to have for future projects. Um, all of that is just to say, that, of course, Bartlett is here to answer any questions you have specific to their fund balance, but it's not quite apples to apples to how we think of like our unrestricted fund balance. Um, and so if, I guess I'll just pause there before I try to explain something that I know very little about and see if there are questions for Bartlett. Are there questions for Bartlett about the fund balance? So you know, All right, moving on to something we're Wait, far. wait, wait. Ms. Wall has a question. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this may be for Ms. Kester, but, but maybe for the possible uh, the hospital board. Um, I think, Ms. Kester, you just said they have a certain amount that is required to be um, set aside for future capital projects. Is that a requirement or just a practice? Ms. Kester. Yeah, I would defer to uh, Bartlett for that. 
These are board designated funds for capital replacement. It's based on a Medicare rule that sets aside your depreciation on an annual basis and it protects that from offsetting costs. So it's done for reimbursement reasons as well as securing capital for future um, capital purchases. Ms. Wall, do you have a follow-up? Are you good? Um, I'm maybe that makes sense to me, but also, so it's, is it, it's a, what I think I hear is it's a, it's a common practice, but not a requirement. That would be accurate. Go ahead, Ms. Kester. Something we're far more familiar with is our own uh, CBJ fund balance. And so uh, this number captures $5.6 million, captures the uh, amount of your fund balance after the action taken on um, Monday night, uh, the last regular assembly meeting to approve emergency funds. Now, remember, we are um, expecting those emergency funds to be reimbursed, all but 150,000 of those funds to be reimbursed. Um, the, the That resolution appropriated it from fund balance, um, but th that's kind of the summary of that 5.6 million. Um, then there's FY24 savings that are not included in your budget forecast. So as we work through our budget process and preparing for audit, um, we believe that there will be uh, $2 million in anticipated personnel savings. And so that would be something that we're confident saying that you would be adding, you know, once we make it through the audit process, you would be adding that to your bottom line. The other item there is um, assembly child care grant. You have $190,000 left in that for fiscal year 24. However, our practice has been to just carry that forward for the next fiscal year. So while that's, that's money that you could reappropriate the practice is just to continue to fund it in, in the next uh, forward year. Moving on to other potential funding sources, um, I highlight that uh, the assembly approved $900,000 for a Coogan uh, LLC through the Affordable Housing Fund and that um, negotiation just hasn't worked out. It, it didn't work. The, uh, the essential terms and conditions did not work for uh, that business and so that money will revert back to the Affordable Housing Fund. The Affordable Housing Fund is uh, at a little over $4 million. We have about $5.8 million in requests this year, some of them far more ripe and far more um, you know, uh, viable than other requests. Uh, if you recall that money, uh, 1.2 million was appropriated from fund balance to be able to meet uh, two project demands this year. So I just flagged that because it's a, a little bit of a unique circumstance. Um, the next item on the list are capital improvement projects. I mean, I think uh, when you look at the one-liner, which is, I don't know, which is this one-liner is in the back of your CIP when we give you your draft ICIP. And there's, you know, probably a hundred million dollars in, in various projects for the entire city, which includes Bartlett and, and JSD of projects that are in process. And all of those projects have various levels of progress made towards them. Um, and I was uncomfortable saying you should pull money from, you know, this project or that project because that, I've spent a lot of time looking at that list lately. And uh, aside for a few things that we moved on relatively quickly and one in your packet today, I didn't find anything that, uh, you know, was, was particularly dormant. With the exclusion of the UA, U.S. fisheries terminal land purchase. You recall a few years ago, you appropriated funds to docks and harbors to purchase um, building behind the Vogue Tech Center where we currently have a haul out, uh, a haul out facility. Well, we don't have the own the haul out facility. We lease to a private company to do the haul out facility. And um, that lease came up. We wanted to purchase the land because there's a public interest in the haul out. UAS is not interested in selling us the land, so we're continuing to lease it. So that's just something, again, that I flagged uh, as a, a, a possibility. I'm happy to talk about other individual capital projects uh, if uh, the, the body desires and could, could bring you a long list and make your eyes glaze over on that. Any questions so far? Mr. Kelly. Thank you. And to uh, clarify uh, that UAS item you're talking about, uh, which item is that? Uh, that's on page 46? 
Or is that uh, no, that oh. it's not itemized on your list. This is just one of the capital projects uh, that you know. I mean, another capital project you could say. Yeah. Yo, thank you. You just he just needed page number, and I just kept talking. <laughs> thank you. The I but uh, I will um, just note that page forty six is a list of the assembly grants and their status at the meeting in July. The body asked for, you know, what grants have we committed? Have we not committed? Do we want to relook at any of that? And again, we didn't find anything that we could recommend relooking at, but wanted to include that information in your packet. Um, just moving on, um, I think uh, the recommendation, um, manager's recommendation in July was to fund hospice and home health. You introduced an ordinance to, to do that um, and need to identify a funding source. Uh, I think that's relatively straightforward if that's still the intent. So maybe tackling both of those funding, you do have an ordinance in your packet, but maybe kind of discussing both of the funding sources um, at the same time would be prudent. Uh, Rainforest Recovery Center is a little bit more complicated because we've had some opportunities with Gaston Human Services kind of stepping up and some conversations with them. So I think I'm gonna turn it over to Deputy Manager Barr to explain we are where we are in that conversation. Could you stop for one second? Um, with the assembly, do we want to deal with home health and hospice first before we go to reinforced recovery? I'm seeing nods. So um, any questions or comments on this before we have a motion that I know Ms. Hale has? Ms. Hale, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I move, uh, I move that the Finance Committee forward to the Assembly uh, Ordinance uh, Serial Number 2024-01BG, uh, appropriating $386,000 uh, for hospice and home health. And I move that the funding sources would be $200,000 from general fund and $186,000 from Bartlett fund balance. Any objection, Mr. Smith? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just for a question for the maker of the motion, can you share with us your rationale for those for that split? Uh, yes, Mr. Smith. Um, I think that I, I know that Bartlett is uh, working very hard right now, and it's an estimate that it'll be 386 needed for this fiscal year, and they're working very hard to um, to bring the hospice and home health um, sort of match uh, revenues and, and costs. And I think that uh, part of my reasoning is knowing that they're doing that and that they're on that trajectory now um, so that maybe the 200,000 comes from general fund and they don't need the full 186 from their own general fund. In, uh, but in part also, I am extremely leery of spending our own general fund um, Given the situation that we're in, in general, we didn't leave a lot of money, and we knew we weren't leaving a lot of money after, um, we, you know, after our funding cycle this year, after our budget cycle, and we have um, some very new, uh, extremely demanding things on our horizon. And I am just really leery about spending too much money from our fund balance. Thank you, Ms. Hale. Ms. Wall. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I am, this is a question for you, Madam Mayor, just from an order of operations perspective, I had um, a suggestion of some reappropriation of funds back into the general fund to help with both offsetting, well, potentially offsetting this impact on our general fund and rainforest recovery. I'm wondering from a, would you rather us have that, me make that motion before we um, start utilizing general fund for these or would you like that to happen afterwards i'm looking at the maker of the motion do you want to go ahead and keep your motion and proceed forward or have ms wall's motion may i ask ms wall are you proposing then that you would propose different fund sources is that what you're saying well um what we have in front of us i interpreted as things that could be deappropriated from the general fund in order to free up space in the general fund. And I, I won't speak for other members, but for me, 
knowing that we have more money in the general fund will make it easier for me to make decisions about um, about allocating resources from the general fund to, to these two projects. Does that make sense? Yeah, Madam Mayor, I could withdraw my motion and we could have that discussion and then I could make another motion if you'd like. All right, we'll go ahead of that. Ms. Withdraw. Wall, if you wanna do your motion. Sure. Um, my motion, and I'm sorry folks, if I'm catching folks by surprise here, but um, uh, my motion would be to direct staff to um, draft an ordinance that would change the funding source of our emergency resolution um, that we passed at our last meeting um, of up to $505,000 from the restricted budget reserve. Um, I would have made this motion, if I could speak to my motion, Madam Mayor. Uh, go ahead. I would have made this motion um, when we passed the emergency resolution um, a few weeks ago, but because it was an emergency resolution um, and it didn't say up to, uh, that was not the appropriate time to do it. Um, a restricted budget reserve, I believe, is for this purpose to cover emergencies that we believe are going to be uh, paid back to us. And so, um, and that is my understanding that $505,000 of that appropriation we expect to be reimbursed for. And so I would, this would basically um, take that money out of the restricted budget reserve instead of our general fund. Okay, thank you, Ms. Wall. And uh, we see Ms. Flick nodding her head. So I don't know if you wanna make a comment, Ms. Flick. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The um, emergency resolution included um, some funding that was related to the um, utility and then a portion that was general fund, 655,000. And that general fund included a portion for stormwater um, repairs for debris um, pick up, those will both be reimbursable. The, there was another 150 that was related to um, planning and looking forward, and that will not be reimbursable. So with the restricted budget reserve um, being in play, we need to have a plan to repay the restricted budget reserve. So the reimbursement would be our plan to repay the budget reserve. Okay, any questions on the motion? Mr. Smith. Madam Mayor. Ms. Flick, what's our certainty level on it being re and that amount being reimbursed and from whom? Very high. Okay. Um, our, our experience from 2023 um, has been um, good working with the state Thank to you. get reimbursements. And um, unfortunately, having had practice, we were good about our documentation this year. Any further questions? Ms. Wall, could you restate the amount on your motion? Five hundred and five thousand dollars. Five hundred five hundred thousand dollars. Got it. Yes. Um, Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you. It was my understanding that the wording of Ms. Wall's motion was that we are directing staff to draft an ordinance. Would this uh, alternatively be appropriate uh, for an emergency, another emergency resolution? Ms. Fleck, we'll go to you for that. Uh, we actually had some discussion about the an appropriate vehicle, and we felt like um, an ordinance that deappropriates from the emergency resolution and the reappropriates from the restricted budget reserve would be a clean way to do that, and it would allow for the public process. Thank you, Ms. Fleck. All right, we have a motion. Any objection? Seeing none, that motion pass. Thank you, Ms. Wall. We'll come back to Ms. Hale. Madam Mayor, I don't know what Ms. Wall's intent is, but I suppose I could make my motion and then if Ms. Wall wants to redirect, we could do that. So I move uh, that the Finance Committee move uh, Ordinance 2024-01BG to the full assembly with the funding uh, $200,000 from general fund and 186,000 from the Bartlett fund balance. Any objection? Seeing none, that motion passes. All right, so we'll go to Mr. Barr with, I think that's where we were headed. Oh, oh I'm sorry, Ms. Wall. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd just like to make one more motion on hospice and home health. Um, I would move that um, to direct the manager to include um, $200,000 uh, for hospice and home health in the FY, in her FY25 budget. Um, so that when we get to um, providing direction and, and discussing um, the budget that it is already wrapped into our budget and we can be um, uh, having a holistic conversation about our budget moving forward. I believe you meant FY26, is that correct? Yes, next year, whatever next year is. It's a good thing I'm acting finance chair. <laughs> I object. Um, Ms. I haven't even said, have there any objections yet? Any objections, Ms. Hale? <laughs> I object, although I won't be here for that FY26 budget cycle. Um, I, and I only object because I do know that Bartlett is working really hard on a trajectory to bring, uh, bring both of these services in line where costs and revenues equal. So I, I, I don't know, I mean, I guess maybe it's a comment or maybe uh, Madam Manager can consult with Bartlett before she includes that amount in the, in the budget just to make sure that the understanding where Bartlett is headed. Uh, and that maybe that's a question for Ms. the maker of the motion. Ms. Wall, so that's a question to you and then you had a comment. <laughs> um, thank you, Madam Mayor and Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, it, to me, this is a placeholder. They asked for five years of funding, if we um, remember, and for that stability uh, to figure out how to make this program sustainable. Um, and so, uh, to me, this is a, a bottom number for showing that commitment um, and making sure that when the convert, when the assembly has our whole budget conversation, that we know that this is an item that we are intending to provide funding for. Thank you, Ms. Wall. And did you have another comment on that? Because you had your hand raised. Ms. Wall, did you have another comment on that? Because you had your hand raised. Okay. So we have a motion, we have objection. Any further discussion, Mr. Smith and then Ms. Atkinson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I guess I'm just trying to think of maybe the manager. Can you explain to me how that motion will affect your, when you meet with Bartlett and any, I mean, are you, from here, are, would you just add into the budget 200,000 for a home and hospice even I guess that's the direction, regardless of what the ho you hear from the hospital or what you, you know, read in the tea leaves from the assembly. You're just you will just put in two hundred thousand for these two programs. Ms. Manager, yeah, correct. Uh, with a motion like that, it would definitely include uh, that funding in the proposed budget. Um, certainly, at the time for if there's any new information, um, like all of a sudden Bartlett doesn't want $200,000 from us, which, uh, which I, you know, I find unlikely, um, then I would share that information with you. Mr. Smith. And then should they request 100, whatever the number is above and beyond that 200,000 there, that would be a pending list item or something. Very good, thank you. If it got moved to the pending list, yes. Ms. Atkinson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I was just going to express my support for this motion. I We see what inconsistent or unreliable funding does to many uh, entities throughout the state. We see what it does to our schools. I think it's really important to, at the very least, have an amount that they can count on in future years for this program that I think the Assembly does want to continue. And we've said wants to continue. And if they need less, then I think that's something we can change next year. But I, I support having it in the budget. Thank you, Ms. Atkinson. Anybody want to comment? Okay, we have a motion and we have objection. Madam Clerk, sorry, Ms. Wendell, you need to come up with a different title for you. Please call the roll. <laughs> Thank you. On the motion to direct the manager to include $200,000 for hospice and home health in the FY26 manager's proposed budget. Assemblymember Wall. Yes. Assemblymember Hale. No. Assemblymember Smith? Yes. Assemblymember Kelly? Yes. Assemblymember Atkinson? Yes. Assemblymember Hughes-Scandies? Yes. 
Mayor Weldon. Yes. Motion passes, six A's, one nay. All right, thank you. Ms. Wall, do you have any more motions up your sleeve? <laughs> okay, with that, we will go to Mr. Barr for the Rainforest Recovery Center. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just a couple of things on this point. We, since the last meeting, have had a handful of meetings with uh, Gaston Human Services uh, and with Bartlett on this topic. I'm very grateful that GHS is here tonight because I'm going to attempt to speak to their business a little bit, and I imagine uh, you might have questions that I won't be able to answer. But um, some of the things we learned uh, in those meetings is that uh, Gaston Human Services has uh, a model uh, where they are able to achieve financial sustainability uh, in providing 3.1 level of services. One of the reasons uh, that, that we learned that, um, that that financial sustainability is different at the 3.1 level of care versus the 3.5 level of care uh, is because Medicare, Medicaid reimbursement rates are pretty similar uh, between the two, despite the fact that 3.5 requires physician level support. Um, that is, is quite costly. So one, one point of information there. Um, another uh, GHS is working on an expansion program. They have between four and eight additional beds that they are planning on um, uh, adding uh, to their existing beds uh, at, at 3.1. Um, and then it's my understanding as well that there is an ongoing conversation, although Bartlett uh, and GHS could speak more closely to this, as I haven't been at all of those meetings, uh, between the two entities uh, to uh, hopefully in the future be able to provide that medical level of support from the hospital to GHS when they have clients in their 3.1 program who would benefit from that higher level of physician-assisted, physician-directed care that is provided at 3.5. Um, the, the last bit of information that I'll note uh, is also on, uh, it's in Bartlett's presentation, it's on page 56 and 57 of your packet, um, and that is just that uh, 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 Mr. Sweetsky, I uh, hope I'm getting that correctly, uh, noted that at the 3.1 level of care, uh, between nine and 19 hours of uh, weekly uh, support uh, are provided to clients. And currently, Gaston Human Services provides 18 hours a week, so relatively similar in most respects to a 3.5 level without that physician-assisted piece. Um, so those are those are just the things that the, I wanted to, to pull out. Uh, there are graphs on page 57 and 58 of your packet that uh, spell all of this out in um, in some detail uh, as well. Oops, oops! If I turn on the mic, any questions for Mr. Barr? Ms. Atkinson, then Ms. Hale. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This might be for Gas No Human Services. Um, I could be totally wrong about this, but I was under the impression that Gas No Human Services did provide 3.5 level of care for re-entrants. Is that true or no? Not all. Okay. Never mind then. You answered the question yourself. Um, Ms. Zale. Thank you, Ma Madam Mayor. Um, Mr. Barr, you talk about uh, GHS offering 3.1 level services, and then if they need a psychiatrist or physician level services, Bartlett would have those. And would the billing rate be different so that somebody's not losing a bunch of money on that? Mr. Barr. So my understanding, I'll take a stab at this, and uh, Mr. Water and Mr. Warden can, can jump in, but my, my understanding is that the, the sort of preliminary model that is being discussed would have GHS still providing a 3.1 level of care and still receiving the reimbursement rate at that level for all of the clients that they are serving. And when additional medical support uh, for a client is needed, um, those services uh, would, could, maybe sometimes are provided by an external agency, Bartlett, Search, uh, Jammy. Um, and when those services are provided, they are billed for separately and on top of the 3.1 level reimbursement the GHS currently and would continue to receive. Ms. Walla, do you have a question? My question was just answered, thanks. Thank you, any further questions? Ms. Hale, you wanna throw a motion out there and see 
illicit discussion. <laughs> Maybe you have another question. Go. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Hughes Candies. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. You just didn't see me and I gave up, but I'll ask. Um, so with the absence of the medical monitoring at the 3.1 level for somebody in the area who needed medical monitoring um, at a higher level, a 3.1 wouldn't be an appropriate thing to enter. Is that correct? Mr. Burr. Thank you. I think I would defer to GHS on that question. All right. You have to come up and speak. We can't nod heads in the audience. <laughs> can't have Mr. Barr say it all. <laughs> Go ahead and answer the question now. Thank you. Um, so as I understand the question, it's if somebody would require that level of medical complexity, they wouldn't necessarily be appropriate for 3.1 services. Question Is that, yeah, no. question mark. Um, what, that's not entirely true. Um, the truth about service delivery in Alaska, I moved to Juneau two years ago. I've moved here from the Kenai Peninsula and uh, worked in this industry there. The truth is that Alaskans are very good at piecemealing resources together that don't exist in our communities. It's one of the things that I think makes Alaska resilient um, in its communities. And so the reality is it's a, it's, it's a model we already operate under. Um, building those collaborative partnerships to provide those medical services while also providing the services that we can provide is an essential component of just being able to survive in this industry, <laughs> in this state. And so a lot of those relationships are there. I think the proposal would be to strengthen the relationship between Bartlett uh, and Gaston and Human Services so that rather than trying to find someone <laughs> that can help us meet that client's need in that moment, we know where we can turn to immediately and we have maybe a, a facilitated entry into that rather than having to start from scratch. Follow up. Mm -hmm. So in a hypothetical situation where this, you have enough services for people who are entering at a lower level because you're able to piecemeal and we'll have something in place that makes it a streamline to that piecemeal. If someone was needed to enter services who is in need of a medically assisted detox or something like that, you would anticipate using Bartlett for those services? I think it would be the first partner we reach out to uh, and then exploring other options as they become available or, or necessary. Okay. Thanks. And I think a lot of, uh, just to add on to, a lot of um, withdrawal management, which is what we call detox now, withdrawal management has changed a lot over the, the past 20 years. Um, the idea that uh, there's more uh, withdrawal management being done in outpatient settings with medical supervision than in the past. And we find that clients tend to be a lot more successful in spaces where they are in their own spaces rather than um, you know, in a space where they're being held or where they feel like they can't walk out. Uh, and so that outpatient medically monitored withdrawal management is something that's becoming more of an industry standard rather than the exception. Any further follow-ups, Ms. Suskins? All right. Ms. Hale, we'll come to you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I uh, move that we direct staff to draft an ordinance uh, appropriating $500,000 uh, for Rainforest Recovery Center uh, for Bartlett uh, Hospital, Regional Hospital, and we direct staff to continue working with Gastineau Human Services um, to, uh, to make a, a smooth uh, transition between Bartlett and Gastineau Human Services. And I ask for unanimous consent. And your fund source? Fund source, GF. Yeah. Okay. Any questions on the motion? Um, Ms. Wall. Um, this is a question um, for Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, in the last motion, you um, provided the source of the additional funding it would take to uh, fund this program for the year um, from, from Bartlett. Was that your intent to name how the rest of this would be funded? Uh, Ms. Wall, my intent is that uh, 500000 keeps uh, Bartlett's program going as they're transitioning to Gastineau Human Services. So it's not that the rest would come from Bartlett's fund balance. It's that that program or the services that program provides would be transitioned to Gastineau Human Services 
as possible. So obviously, if, if they work very hard to make that transition occur, and it's just not going to happen this year, uh, I would envision them coming back to the assembly, Bartlett coming back to the assembly. Ms. Wall? Um, I'll, I'll object then, um, because I think that's a pretty quick timeline to figure out how this program is going to function in this current year. Okay, Mr. Smith. I guess I was just going to ask staff or Casting Human Services or who or Bartlett. I mean, is three months? I mean, that's a quarter, three months. Like, is that is that how does does that is that a good place to start? Who gets to answer that question? Well, I guess I'll, I'll I'll start, but I think we've got multiple perspectives on that. Um, you know, I think that the recommendation in your memo from uh, the three of us was to um, fund rainforest recovery in some amount to demonstrate the assembly's uh, commitment to continuing to provide those services. So, you know, Bartlett has spent the first three months of this fiscal year already on those services and, and has kind of, the original ask was for you to fund this so that they, in order for them to keep the doors open. Since that July meeting, a lot has transpired with, you know, potential partnerships, a lot of, uh, of understanding of you know what that level of what a 3.1 level of service looks like, so you know in when we made that recommendation for um, some commitment of some level of funding, it really uh, we really don't know right we really don't know like how long it might take. There's a lot of unanswered questions, but in my um, you know speaking with Bartlett and uh, others, it feels like. Uh, you know, it would be it would be difficult for Bartlett to turn around and just close rainforest recovery without continuing a, a plan um, with that direction from the assembly and some funding. Is there a magic number? I think that might be a question for Bartlett, but uh, I think you know, five hundred thousand is definitely demonstrates assembly intent. Does anybody from Bartlett want to weigh in? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, thank you. First of all, we're very grateful for the funding for hospice and home health. We're also very encouraged with our discussions at the manager's office with uh, GHS that we could transition. Uh, some thought as early as December 1st. Things tend to go a little bit longer than that. But hopefully by next February, we could have a program that is um, meets the needs of the community much lower cost and for the need that GHS specifies, the ability to provide the clinical services over there. So while our intent was to ask for the full funds, I think we have a really good plan whether or not we can execute as fast, it really uh, is yet to be determined, but 500,000 gets us a long way there. All right, thank you. Um, Ms. Atkinson, did I see your hand up? Ms. Wall. Thank you. Um, just a, another follow-up question. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Wharton, for that answer. If 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 you don't um, uh, get it done, you know, in time, and this five hundred thousand dollars, five hundred and five, whatever it is, five hundred thousand dollars runs out. Um, would you would would the board allocate Bartlett funding for it, or would they close the program? I think that's where I'm confused by the by the motion. We're already you're already spending on this on this year, and so just curious if that m money that the assembly has allocated isn't enough for that transition. What would happen? We, we are already funding the program through our fund balance. I can't speak for the board, but I would imagine if we're just one month or two months away that we'd want to bridge that uh, program simply because of the fact staffing is very hard to, to keep in place if you shut down a program, if that's n necessary. So um, I can't speak for my chair, but I think that's what they might do because of the commitment that they have to this program. Thank you, and um, I'll speak to this, if I may, as 
um, I will, uh, before this program, I just $500,000 just looks like a nice place to start. And I'll, I think you have the whole intention of the assembly to say not close the program. So you've already spent some fund balance. We have $500,000. If that runs out, I'm assuming you'll come back to the assembly and say, we need to continue to have some help until we transition. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, Ms. Hughes Candies. Thanks, Madam Mayor. I guess uh, we have a motion. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll object to that motion. I'm heartened by, I think this is good discussion um, and good sentiment all around. So I'm happy to hear the direction that's moving in. To a certain extent, you know, it can be hard as a community member to follow something from uh, meeting to meeting. And I do think that there have been things that have changed between Bartlett and GHS in a promising direction. And so of course we should respond to change. Um, I got to go out and meet with Mr. Barr and Gasno Human Services and I was really blown away by what I saw. So I do feel as an assembly member, a great deal of relief that with rainforest recovery, if that closes, that we're still going to have services for people in our community. That being said, the reason I mentioned it being hard to follow an uh, issue between meetings is because Rainforest Recovery Center is one of the things that received the most feedback in Bartlett's public outreach, you know, we are restructuring, we need to save money, tell us what you think. And there was a great outcry from many in the community that rainforest recovery was important to the community. Um, I think some of them work in the industry themselves and so I do think they're aware of all the great work that happens at GHS and they still felt like that was important to the community. Um, the manager's recommendation at the July meeting was to have no subsidy and the assembly at that time pushed this forward to the finance with some expressing support for the importance of rainforest recovery, knowing that we would figure out what that right sweet spot dollar we could agree on was. But I think for myself, I'm not looking to demonstrate to the public uh, support for this for this program, <laughs> I want to I want to know that it is truly shored up um, and not just in a stopgap way. If we can find somebody else to provide those services, that's great, and that is a relief. But I think it is a big decision for us seeing these numbers, and I'm not saying we're responsible for the whole state. But I see numbers and I learned in my meeting that uh, Rainforest, for instance, is known for taking um, hard to handle cases where there is like some undiagnosed or some untreated schizophrenia or bipolar. And there's also need for um, there's also need for that. So if this passes and people are comfortable with that $500,000 number, that's great. I, for myself, I think I'm gonna object. I would feel more comfortable in this first year trying to determine where to take that, the funding from, from our other funding sources. Um, so that's where I'm at. Ms. Hale, and then Mr. Kelly. May I ask a question of Ms. Uscandes? I just didn't understand what you, how you closed, and it's just that I can't hear you very well. I, you, you, I just can't tell what you said at the end there. Can you repeat what you said, Ms. Uskandis? I feel confident. I feel like you're gonna, I, if I had to guess, we're about to take a vote and the majority of the assembly will support $500,000 for Rainforest to get to an agreement with GHS, which is good, but it would be my preference to fund it for an entire year at the subsidy that they requested and find the money to do so. And so I'm going to object. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mr. Kelly. Thank you. This is uh, more of a logistical question. If we were to uh, have an ordinance drafted 
would we at that time be able to change the amount or the funding source, or would that um, change some things with public notice? Not if we typically go over, because usually if we draft an ordinance, we can say up to 500,000, and then you can't go over that unless we agree on that amount, unless you want to add anything to slick. Um, the funding source, I don't. Can we change the funding, funding source? I believe we can, because that's not, no, actually, I take it back because that's usually in the title. If it's in the title, um, you would not be able to amend it. I believe that the funding source is in the title. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'll be supporting this motion. It's obviously we have a conundrum here. I mean, $1.8 million is significant. Obviously, we know these services are needed. It seems like we have a way forward here that we can provide the services the community needs, they're not, we're not gonna have everything we want, obviously, and we never do, but we have a, a solution and a collaboration here, and I would thank Bartlett staff, GHS staff, and our staff for coming together on this. Um, you know, we, we, we found $500,000, thanks to Ms. Wall tonight, so, and I've been protective of the fund balance. Um, I, you know, it is an ordinance to introduce. If we hear from the community that they don't think this will work, we can look at that. Um, but again, I think we have a, a way forward here that I'm, I'm happy to support and would like to see through. So I'll be supporting the ordinance. Thank you for the motion. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Any further discussion, Mr. Kelly? Thank you. Um, I, I'm not sure that 500,000 is quite enough for me after the discussion that we've been having. Uh, I also feel like we have more options available to us besides the uh, just the general fund balance. Um, and I see that Ms. Wall has, has her hand raised, but uh, maybe after she's done speaking, I might have a, an amendment uh, to propose. Ms. Wall. I was about to make amendment, so Mr. Kelly is welcome to go first. You can go ahead, Ms. Wall. Mr. Ms. Wall, go ahead. All right, I was doing it because nobody else is doing it. Um, uh, I move to um, change the um, dollar amount to one million dollars um, instead of five hundred thousand. Just recognizing that this is a a big lift to to make changes. Um, you know, in a short period of time, and um, I think the more resources we can commit to it, um, the the easier it's going to be for us to get the outcome that, that we want. True, all kinds of hands raised for this one. Uh, Mr. Kelly and then Ms., uh, excuse me, uh, where's your fund source coming from, I should ask? I'm just increasing the amount, um, so it would still be from general fund. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Kelly, and then Ms. Oh, okay. Quit pointing up to her. I can see that she raised her hand, Mr. Smith. <laughs> Madam Mayor, I'm going to object to this. I, I I understand and appreciate what my fellow assembly members are trying to do. I also am like, let's give it a shot. We've heard from the board <laughs> that if they want more funds, they can come back. I'm looking at our fund balance at. 5.6 million, that is the lowest I've ever seen in my five years on the assembly. It gives me pause. I think we have, I think we have a way forward here and I guess I kind of don't want to commit more than we need to. And again, they will come back to us should these funds not be sufficient. So I'll oppose the motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you. I uh, might be a little more concerned about uh, the time frame that would, we would need in order to effectively respond if they did need additional funds. Uh, that is why I think I'd be more comfortable providing them with a higher ceiling than, and then maybe they don't spend some of, some of that money. Um, I, in my the amendment I was considering proposing, I was considering uh, changing the fund source um, to, to the fisheries, so perhaps the, the, uh, the purchase of the uh, UAS uh, fisheries terminal land purchase. Um, so that way we could still protect some of our general fund and also uh, show our support for the, uh, the UAS. But I think I might make that motion depending on whether or not this passes. Um, 
Ms. Hill. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm just, um, I, I appreciate what Mr. Smith uh, indicated in, in his comments that, um, and I see nods from board members that we are, uh, we are providing some money, we're providing a path forward and the board knows that they can come back to us if that's not enough. And what I have seen in my years on the assembly is that when money is provided to uh, programs or departments or uh, um, enterprise funds, it is spent. So it's not like we give them a million dollars and if they only spend 800,000, somehow they bring 200,000 back. That doesn't happen. <laughs> it is spent and it's not like people are wasting money. There's endless costs. So, um, and I've also just done a quick back of the en envelope calculation and of that 1.76 million, I think about 688,000 would be serving Juno residents and the rest would be serving people in the rest of the state. And I don't have anything against the rest of the state. I love the state, but we have to care for our residents and this money comes from our residents. And so I'm just very, very cautious, uh, especially given that we are seeing a path forward. I am very cautious about uh, spending excessive money from our very small fund balance um, that we, we, we may not need to spend. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hale, almost called you Ms. Well, sorry. Um, doesn't look like I'll object also. Um, same reasons probably Mr. Smith said. Um, I just see that's too big of a hit for our fund balance. When we've given a path forward, we've said that if they need to have more, they could come back. I think that's the way to go right now. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. Mr. Smith. I would just remind the body that we have seven members so four or three votes would be problematic. I, I'm happy to, counting the number of people in the room, I can remove my amendment given that I've heard from um, multiple, en enough people to know that I can't pass. Uh, thank you, Ms. Wall, for doing that. So move us along right now. So we're back to the main motion with objection. Anybody else have a comment? See none, Madam, Ms. Wendell, would you call roll? Thank you. On the motion to direct staff to draft an ordinance for $500,000 of general funds for Rainforest Recovery Center and direct staff to continue working with Gasno Human Services to ensure a smooth transition of care. Assembly Member Hale. Yes. Assembly Member Wall. Yes. Assembly Member Hughes Scandies. No. Assembly Member Smith. Yes. Assembly Member Atkinson. Yes. Assembly Member Kelly. Yes. Madam Mayor. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, thought you missed Hale. This motion passes six days, one day. Thank you, Ms. Wendell. Thank you for counting better than I can. Um, so are we done with the hospital right now or do we have more for the hospital? Uh, one more. Oh, Ms. Wall. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'll make a similar motion as I did on the last item. I would move that we direct the manager to include um, in the FY26 budget $500,000 um, to support um, rainforest recovery or its newest form. I think we know that the intent here is to save money, but we also know that there is going to be a subsidy needed to keep these services um, and so I would rather have that conversation as part of our larger budget conversation, which is why I'd like it in the budget um, for next year as our as our starting place. Any objection? Ooh, all kinds of hands. <laughs> we'll start with Ms. Hale, Mr. Smith, and Ms. Atkinson. Madam Mayor, I object, even though, again, I won't be there for that, that budget conversation. Um, <laughs> I, um, it's, a, it's a very unusual thing to start including uh, um, items in the manager's budget that are typically included in an enterprise budget. And we're suddenly going very outside the budget cycle 
for FY26 in this conversation. Um, there is a mechanism and a pathway for the Bartlett budget to come to the assembly, and it's not typically this. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hale. Mr. Smith. Uh, echo Ms. Hale's comments, and if we had three objections, I just, oh, oh maybe, I, maybe I assumed, excuse me. Um, anyway, uh, I, I think, again, they will come back to us should they need it. Um, so I'll oppose the motion. Uh, thank you, Ms. Atkinson and Mr. Kelly. I'm speaking in support of this motion. I mentioned last time that consistency is really important, especially in programs like these. And personally, I would rather we keep reinforced recovery at the same level of care in the same place with Bartlett. But since that's not on the table, I think the very least we should be doing is supporting them at this level in future years so that they know they have that consistent funding and can plan accordingly. So I do support this motion. Uh, Mr. Kelly. Okay, so I will object also um, for similar reasons that the other two have spoken. Um, the idea for this is for it to go to gas and human services and until they can figure out all their funding sources, I would hate to put this in our budget at this time until they can figure out their own. And I would agree with Ms. Hale that it becomes an enterprise fund, not so much as a, as a CBJ funding. Madam Clerk, you have a motion and objection. Or Ms. Hale, Ms. Wall, do you want to do anything different or? I can withdraw my motion. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Okay, anything else, Ms. Wall? <laughs> okay, are we dealing with Bartlett? Okay. Well, I, okay, I was gonna, okay. <laughs> okay, we will take uh, till 7.15. Where are we now? Thank you. The next item on your agenda, being all things Bartlett, is a request uh, from Bartlett to appropriate $8.9 million of uh, their uh, fund balance to the ED addition renovation project. If you recall, that's been a high priority of the hospital for some time. Um, the uh, project was put on hold a couple of years ago when kind of some fiscal, the fiscal instability uh, was found. That was after we, uh, CBJ Engineering, had already awarded a contract for alternative procurement. So we had to cancel that um, that contract. And that was with, I believe that was with Dawson. And um, so the uh, hospital would like to proceed with the project. We, by code, cannot, uh, cannot commit to construction for a project without having full funding available. They have $6 million of the almost $9 million in additional funding that they need for the project uh, secured in grant funding. $4 million of that is congressionally directed spending that has been awarded, but the process just, it, it can take a very long time. We still don't, we still don't see congressionally directed spending from almost two years ago that, that CBJ has received. So that's just, depending on the agency, it's a it's a bureaucratic. And then there's another Denali Commission grant. And so this was referred to the Finance Committee from the Public Works and Facilities Committee who saw it in, on August 5th, knowing that there would be all these conversations about uh, fund balance and hospital budget and long-term um, operating on the table today. So um, normally th these types of requests just get forwarded to the assembly from PWFC, but given the nature of this conversation, it was sent to the Finance Committee. Thank you, Madam Manager. Does anybody from the hospital want to speak to this one? Mr. Mertz? Yeah, um, thank you, Mayor and uh, Ms. Kester. We've dealt with this several times in Finance Committee over the last year and a half. Uh, we originally had a project that had been worked on prior to when Ms. Kester was manager. Uh, that uh, we uh, chose in uh, March of 22, uh, I think, to suspend because of uh, the project got large and we decided that, uh, you know, the ED project needed to kind of be refocused. And so we've gone through a large uh, process to refocus that project, bring it down in cost, make it address the areas that it really needs to address. And as part of that also, we were able to secure the CDS funding that Ms. Kester spoke about, and we're reasonably confident 
um, that we will also get $2 million in Denali Commission money. The project needs to move forward. They're ready to go. And so uh, we, uh, through the Finance Committee process and also Planning Commission or Planning Committee uh, at the hospital, uh, we evaluated the change. We made the change to the project, and it really makes sense. To me, it's kind of an administrative thing. We, we feel pretty comfortable we're going to get the funding and the project needs to go forward. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions by any member of the body before we have a motion, Mr. Smith? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just to confirm, the, the federal funds were in a bill, like an appropriation bill that actually passed Congress and was signed by the, I mean, like it is not Correct. just. Okay, very good. And then. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> I, had a, I had another one just in case. Um, Go ahead. It, it was, does this, does this expansion um, addition, does it, will it, change the revenue picture at all or is it kind of just a need to do to keep up with standards or whatever mr uh, Warden. no no first of all um the importance of the ed to a hospital is it's the only thing that's really unique besides ors and inpatient beds and the the emergency department that we have there isn't really set up for some of the modern diseases that that we're seeing throughout the United States, like a COVID or others. And so while the design only adds, I think, a little over 12,015 square feet for improved patient access and waiting rooms, the real importance of this change is changing some of our rooms from uh, positive pre or neutral pressure to negative pressure. That allows you to take care of certain types of patients. And so we're adding, um, let's see, two negative uh, pressure exam rooms, uh, one triage negative pressure room. We're also adding another behavioral um, uh, health safe room. So we go from 13 rooms to 15, but the type of patient you can handle there safely changes uh, quite a bit. So that brings us into what I would say is a much more modern um, uh, uh, infrastructure for the ED, as well as there's going to be other things, for example, how we um, handle the drugs, how we uh, are able to see our patients and, and other things of that nature. Any further questions on this, use candies? Thank you, Madam Mayor. So just to confirm I'm reading this correctly, the amount that you have available today in hand is 3,458,000. And you have received notice of award uh, of a CDS for 4 million, and those are a nightmare, but you'll get it eventually. <laughs> I have faith. Um, but the 2 million from Denali Commission, that is just an, a request at this point. Uh, that's right, uh, Ms. Hughes-Candis, and if, if we, for whatever reason, don't get the $2 million, we'll look to secure other funding. There's other places that we can go apply for that, so, um, you know, we're pretty pretty confident. I, uh, so, answer your question. Ms. Wall. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've, I've seen a lot of large CIP requests come through. Um, this body from Bartlett over the years and normally I kind of you know uh, trust y'all and make the right decisions um and but you know I was on the assembly when we you know approved the Aurora building so I'm trying to be a little bit more careful and asking questions and doing my due diligence um I um am curious you know you're in the middle of a leadership transition um how confident do you feel that on the other side of this transition, this will still be a priority uh, for for the um, for the hospital? And can you talk a little bit about the board support? Was this you know unanimous uh, decision to to move forward with this project, or is there some debate on the board? Who's, well, if Mr. I was in your, if Go ahead, I, Mr. Burns. Oh, I'm sorry. If, if I was in your shoes, I'd hold our, the Bartlett board's feet to the fire a little bit more, too. I mean, we've got uh, some uh, making up to do there on our credibility front. We're working like crazy to do that. Um, so uh, we have scrutinized this project at several committees. 
Um, I think it's important to point out that this is an ED dr staff driven uh, project as well. They've been very involved in, in you know, the development and, uh, you know, how to make this thing work right. I mean, there's even things like the view plane changes that have been modernized that are needed over there that we don't have. So, uh, you know, these, I don't think that, you know, this thing started uh, three or four administrations ago at the hospital and the need uh, continues. I, you know, this isn't a, uh, you know, kind of a one-off that somebody's going to decide in six months that we don't need. Mr. Warden, did you have anything to add? You are nodding your head. Yeah, I would say, you know, our, our uh, ringer in here is our chief operating officer. She's been a director of the ED, so a lot of the work that's been going on in terms of design has been between our chief operating officer and the physicians and their staff. They've had a committee that's worked and so while uh, they might say they didn't get everything that they need, they got what, what they want, they got what they needed. And I think the design has been settled. I spoke, uh, and Kim and I both met recently with uh, that a medical group uh, to make sure that they were supportive of not only the design, but supportive of moving forward. And uh, all of the partners of, of that a medical group is very supportive of moving forward. They wanted to make sure that anything that that uh, we were going to do was not going to put the hospital in jeopardy. And because of our improvements and our also just additional funding that we've been receiving, uh, we believe that that the time is right now. What I'd like to point out is that um, it's going to take uh, a year or less to get organized. So in terms of coming in and doing this, uh, we'll be in good position next spring or early summer to start working on, on that. So I think it's, it's not only a high priority at the board, it's a priority of leadership and it's a priority of uh, our largest medical group that works inside the hospital. And I think it's important to note that um, because you have so many boats that come in, the ability to bring airborne diseases and other diseases is fairly high here compared to some other places like Des Moines, Iowa, that they don't really necessarily have that much uh, traffic in. So I think this is something that the community um, does need and we're very supportive of it. Any further, Mrs. Hughes-Candies. Thanks, Madam Mayor. I think my question is, uh, I'll be a little bit conversational because Mr. Mertz just referenced holding the hospital board's feet to the fire. When I look at this to a certain extent, I think, are you crazy? <laughs> Which is what I said in Public Works. And I think it's very well vetted. Uh, and you said, we, we just got to move this forward. But from where I sit, while you're still in a stabilizing phase, it, with the funding source being from fund balance, it seems a little nuts to me, given that earlier in, and when I say earlier, I mean months earlier of this year, we were calculating how many months the hospital had left of, uh, you know, operating balance in your fund balance. So the idea of spending a, a chunk of it on a, on a capital project makes me very nervous to say the least uh, until I feel a little bit more confident. And I see Bartlett board and Bartlett leadership working like crazy and I'm very pleased with all the results we're already seeing. Um, I heard the last two months were uh, quite positive. So to make that into a question, <laughs> Are you crazy? You, you already <laughs> Am I crazy? Am I crazy if I let this through, Mr. Mertz? Because uh, fool me twice, shame on me. Yeah, I, I ask myself if I'm crazy a lot. Yeah, the, uh, I, for somebody that literally uh, goes to bed at night and wakes up in the morning worried about Bartlett's cash, number of days of <laughs> revenue and cash, uh, and it's something that I'm very concerned about uh, you know, that, that drives uh, a close attention to what we're spending and, you know, how we're operating. And, and uh, you know, we did pause this project and we, we, you know, we didn't tear the page up, but we certainly cut the project costs in half, probably, somewhere in that ballpark anyway. I mean, we were around 
I think $18 million in three year ago money and you know now we're you know whatever the number is so I mean we've we've definitely sharpened the pencil on this particular project and I think our staff has worked uh, super hard uh, you know to to be responsive to the needs and I'm gonna I'm gonna go back just to a conversation that Ms. Wall brought up about fund balance um, and which is I'm familiar with our fund balance as well and Capital replacement at hospitals is mind-boggling. The needs, you know, when we we just recently replaced some capital equipment, and it's just hard to wrap your head around the cost of this stuff. I mean, it's just the staff brings this to you, and you go, "You got to be kidding me!" And the reason that we have those restricted amounts sitting aside, I, I think of it as board-designated cash, and then you guys kind of think of it more as a restricted fund balance. And that board-designated cash is just critical. And that's really kind of what the money that when we talk about that component of fund balance, what I think of it is, is okay, we're taking a piece of our board designated cash, we're using it for this project because it's a capital replacement item. It's long overdue, long overdue. And some of these things, uh, you know, it would be nice to put them off, but you put them off and put them off, put them off, and pretty soon you just have to do it. So you're not crazy, um, and, uh, you know, hopefully we're not crazy. Mr. Good answer. Uh, th thank you. And to follow up on uh, Ms. Uskandi's um, comment question, um, I, I think uh, what might be more reassuring to myself would um, perhaps be some sort of uh, timeline in these uh, reimbursement for the grant. Uh, do we do we have any expectation on when we expect to receive um, the congressionally directed spending in the Denali grant? Let me call the federal government real quick. <laughs> I, we don't, unfortunately. I, you know, I'd love to have that clarity as well, too. And, you know, they go through a grant-making process. And of course, it gets dropped into a, into a department, I think, Health and Human Services in this case. It'll go to an agency. An agency grant maker will put it on their queue of projects or, you know, of grants to make. And then it'll come spitting out the backside. And, uh, you know, that, as you know, somebody said, it can take a long time. I mean, it can be two, three, four years for those things to you know, to really burble up. So I don't, that doesn't provide you any clarity, but it's all we got, so. I, I could ask a quick question. So if we postpone this in any way, does that screw up any of your federal funding? Um, does it screw up the other funding if, if we postpone this? Um, the, uh, um, in terms of losing the funding? Well, our, our fund, I don't know the answer to that question, yeah. uh, Madam Mayor. I don't, I don't know the process. One of the things we have done is we've met with some of the staff of uh, Senator uh, Murkowski uh, on a number of different issues, one of which is the funding of this. So we are developing those relationships so we can squeak when we need this. But I just don't know the federal process. I apologize. Thank you. Seeing no more questions, Ms. Hale. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move Ordinance 2024-01B1, uh, appropriating $8.9 million uh, from Bartlett Regional Hospital Emergency Department Capital Improvement Project. Uh, and I move that to the Assembly, and I ask for unanimous consent. Any objection? Seeing none, that's so moved. Next item about the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Who's doing this? Ms. Fleck. I guess it's me. The next item is about the city and borough of Juneau, including uh, the school district. Um, the We have brought the um, audit services to um, the Assembly Finance Committee a couple times. My predecessor also um, had discussion with the AFC. This is on page 67 of your packet. Um, the conversations that have happened in the past have um, revolved around we need to do an RFP for our audit services and we'd like to structure the RFP so that people can bid on doing the whole body of work required by the city in Borough Juno. They can also bid on just doing Bartlett, just doing JSD, and just doing um, the rest of CBJ. 
And so as we have um, worked together, the chief financial officers, both of um, Bartlett um, and the school district and myself have worked together with CBJ purchasing to build an RFP and the scoring criteria, we've, um, we've reached a point where we need your direction. And the issue is um, we can, we have to have a consistent scoring criteria for evaluating people that submit bids for this work. And there's not really an equitable way to um, compare somebody who wants to do just JSD work with somebody who wants to do all of it. So we either need to um, decide as, as a body we wanna do kind of what we've done in the past, which is to get one auditing firm to do the um, financial audit for CBJ, including um, the hospital, which is a department of CBJ, and the school district, which is a component unit. Um, Bartlett and JSD also um, have financial statements prepared individually um, for their units. So we can do um, solicit for one entity to take care of that entire body of work, which is essentially similar to what we're doing today, or we can put out essentially an RFP that says, we're going to look at three different um, groupings, if you will. You can bid on the school district work, which includes an audit and the financial statements. You can um, bid on the Bartlett body of work, which includes an audit and the financial statements, or you can bid on um, CBJ, which includes our audit, which is also include going to need to look at um, the school district and Bartlett um, and, and um, you know, pulling that all together as, as a cohesive audit of the pieces. And I bring it to you today um, looking for that guidance. Um, we will, um, it is unknown if we will end up with one entity that scores the highest. If we put out, you know, kind of for three, do we end up with one single entity that can do all three and scores the best? Um, likely we would end up with different entities and if we end up with three different groups, um, undoubtedly it will cost us more as a city to perform those functions. I don't know how much more that is. Um, if we um, it, do it as, as one piece of work, then um, we would expect similar costs that we're experiencing today. So I'm just looking for direction from this body, how you want us to facilitate that request for proposal. If you want us to go um, kind of status quo, one like we've done in the past, or if you want us to um, issue a request for three different bodies of work. Any questions about this, Mr. Kelly? Thank you. Historically, when we've uh, put this out to bid, uh, how many uh, firms have usually bid on the contract to do everything? Um, thank you, Mr. Kelly. I actually have no idea, but I can find that out, not before you make a decision tonight, but um, I can work with our uh, procurement group to see how many we had the last time it was put out. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Mayor. How much do we spend on audits? In FY25, um, we are looking at about $225,000 for the entire body of work. So Bartlett pays for a portion of that, the school district pays for a portion of that. The bulk of it is with CBJ proper. So if it was more expensive to do three different ones, the school district would pay for their own and the hospital would pay for their own is what you're telling me? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Ms. Hale, um, I see no further questions, go ahead. Thank Try you. one, throw one out there. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <laughs> I would be interested in hearing from the Bartlett board what their preference would be in terms of having a package um, audit or a separate audit auditors for each board or separate bids for the audits, if I may. Absolutely. Bartlett board or Mr. Water? Um, I'll take that. Uh, if, if, sorry, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, our preference is for a separate audit service. And the reason is that um, the complexity of healthcare auditing is uh, grown substantially. And healthcare accounting, healthcare financial reporting, the issues around management operations of a hospital. And there are firms in the United States that specialize 
in uh, you know, doing these the audits of hospitals. And we've identified gaps in the services that we've received so far uh, because of the fact that we haven't been using a firm that's a specialist firm uh, at the national, at a, you know, we're talking about national firms here. I would say that I am sensitive uh, to this topic. Uh, I was the C CBJ's auditor for 25 years. And uh, I also was very involved in the hospital audit and it is just a different animal than it was. And frankly, the school district is too. There are firms that specialize in Alaska doing nothing but school districts. We have two of them here that do a very good job of that. I'd also say that I still, uh, Haynes Burroughs client of mine, um, and I do audit services for them and have for years and years and years. I do not do their school district audit. They bid those separately. There's a, there's a municipal audit RFP and there's a school district audit RFP. The relationship between the two audits, because school district has the same relationship to Haynes Burroughs, CBJ school district does to CBJ, there's, there's audit standards around uh, a group auditor who's the, would be the CBJ audit and the component auditors, as it's called, for Bartlett in the school district. And you coordinate, uh, Allman Rogers in Anchorage does this school district audit for Haynes and we have, you know, the partner and I communicate at the front end of the engagement and it works just fine. So the, the ground's well plowed. Most, most small, uh, most communities in Alaska, frankly, have different um, auditing firms doing different phases of their audit. So this is very common. I would, I wanna speak to the cost. I think it's likely that you're gonna pay more in aggregate by breaking these audits up. I think that's fair. The opportunity cost of, of putting them together is significant as well. And there are, I am fairly confident that we've incurred costs at, the, at um, Bartlett uh, over uh, issues that have come up uh, in our past audits in the recent years uh, without getting into detail. And I, I think that, that uh, those costs aren't captured when you talk about how much, what's the check that you're writing. And so, you know, there's also an expertise value that comes with a firm that really has, understands what they're doing. So we don't do this lightly, believe me. I mean, this is, you know, this it's like everything we're trying to do at Bartley now. We put a lot of thought into it. And so I, I want to add one last thing. I'll be quiet. Um, I really appreciate Ms. Flick. She's been very um, transparent. She's interacted with, with uh, Mr. Warner. I even got to see the a draft of the RFP when it was, and it's a very different and a very refreshing uh, kind of relationship and interaction we're having with the finance department. So. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Does, has the school district expressed a preference for either of these pathways? Ms. Fleck. Uh, Mr. Smith, uh, the school district participated um, with Bartlett and myself of drafting this RFP. Um, Ms. Pierce, who's their chief financial officer, um, has extensive experience with school districts throughout the state. And she's, um, as uh, Mr. Mertz um, stated, is used to having a separate auditing firm um, for the school. They've not been um, um, a huge driver of pushing as um, I would um, maybe categorize the hospital being more of a driver of wanting to look at separating. Ms. Huskanis. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Just wondering about uh, the way it's set up now um, bless you. I'm hoping you can help me uh, think about this. So we have it all under one. Uh, we see Karen Tarver and she works for, our, you always make a point of saying she works for us, not for you. Um, and she meet with us and ask, we can ask questions. And that includes Bartlett and includes, includes the school district. So if we were to break them all up and the school district hires their own auditor, is that auditor gonna work for the school district <laughs> and not for anyone else and not gonna share anything and vice versa for the hospital? Uh, they work for the hospital and not for us. I'm just thinking of that component because I'm gonna wanna read their audits <laughs> and know their dirty laundry. Excellent question, Ms. Hughes-Gandies. Um, the auditor, no matter if it's one or if it's three, works for you as the assembly. 
So um, rest assured that um, the auditors work for you. Um, just as happens today, um, when, when the school district component is complete, um, that school board gets a briefing from the auditor. When the Bartlett section is complete, the board is provided with information about um, that particular audit. So, and then collectively at an assembly finance committee, you hear about all of it. And so that would remain the same. As Mr. Merce indicated, there are, there are standards in place for having multiple auditors. Um, ultimately, you are responsible for the finances, you are responsible um, for that, and so the auditors would work um, for you. Follow up? What a reassuring, reassuring answer. Um, did, could you restate right now the X dollars we pay, the both of them contribute, the school board and Barlett contribute towards that cost? That is correct. Okay. Right now um, it, we do um, break out. So by our charter and our code, Bartlett's not required to have their own financial statements prepared, but um, they need them for other reasons. And so there are components of the development of the financial statements and the audit that Bartlett pays for directly. Um, likewise, with the school district, they, they um, pay a portion of that work as well. Okay, thanks very much. Mr. Kelly. Thank you. I think Ms. Hughes-Gandy's follow-up mostly answered my question. So if we did end up separating these out, it's my understanding then, well, does the school district pay anything additional? Are they likely to um, compared to what they pay now? Go ahead, Ms. Flake. Um, thank you. Assemblymember Kelly, my expectation is that there would be a cost increase um, just by getting um, a, a firm that's likely more specialized in the school district and Bartlett ending up with a firm that's more special, um, specialized in healthcare, um, that I would expect those individual components um, would cost them individually more because we get an economy of scale by having our current auditor, auditor plan the entire engagement and um, work in elements that they need to do for each one in the total cost package. At this point, I could not predict what the cost increase would be. Go ahead, Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you. Um, my, my concern is adding yet more expenses to the school district. Now, we, in our previous discussions here, were talking about possibly moving things from different pockets of money around. Um, as we've experienced, the school district has experienced flat funding from the state, that is becoming less and less of an option for them. So I'm wondering, is it possible perhaps to put out an RFP that would uh, perhaps do everybody but Bartlett if they want to stay separate? Is that sort of a package possible? Ms. Flick. Thank you, Assemblymember Kelly. I will answer in the yes, everything is possible. So we could um, put out a solicitation that says we are looking for a firm to do um, the city and borough of Juneau um, and the component unit, the school district, and we are looking for a firm specifically to look for healthcare um, auditing for the hospital. So we could package it that way. Thank you. Any further questions? However, um, I'll ask a question. However, in your memo, you say that it would be easier on finance staff if it was either all or separated into three, correct? I think we can, um, we need to be clear in how we put the RFP out. So what, what I don't think we could do with Mr. Kelly's um, idea is to say, oh, well, you can bid for um, the city and the school district as one or the city separated from the school district. Like we would just need to say at the start, we're either accepting one proposal, two proposals, or three proposals. And they're gonna be um, healthcare audit proposals are going to be scored and compared against each other and the school district um, Educational auditors are going to be compared and scored against each other compared to municipal. 
Um, so we just need to be clear whichever way we decide to go. All right, thank you. Ms. Hale. <laughs> thank you, Madam Mayor. I, uh, I propose that the direction that the Assembly Finance Committee gives to staff is to solicit three scopes of work, uh, one for Bartlett, one for the school district, and one uh, for CBJ as a whole. And I'd like to speak to my motion, if I may, Madam Mayor. Certainly. Um, thank you. I, I appreciate concerns that people have about cost, but I'm, I'm just looking at overall budgets and thinking about that 250,000. And even if the costs do increase, it's not going to increase enormously, especially given the size of the budgets that we have for our different enterprise entities. And um, I think that you can talk about not wanting to increase expenses, but at what cost? So if you are talking about not increasing expenses, and that means you don't know things that you should know, that's the concern I think that we're hearing expressed, that we may not be knowing what we should know if we don't have those specialized firms. I also have worried in the past that if we, if if our board, if our enterprise board has asked us to give them a separate uh, distinct auditing firm and we don't agree with that, we're tying their hands behind their backs. We're asking them to do a job and we're not allowing them to have the tools that they say they need to do that job. So I, I feel um, firmly that uh, separating it into three separate contracts um, provides our separate entities the tools that they need. Thank you, Ms. Wall. Any, sorry, Ms. Hale. I was looking at Ms. Wall to see if she had anything. Any objection? Mr. Kelly. Thank you. I, I think I spoke to my objection earlier when I was asking my question. I, I do support Bartlett in, uh, in having its own separate audit. It makes sense. It's a specialized field. However, I am very hesitant to add any further expense to the school district. And so I would um, move to amend uh, Ms. Hale's motion that we would package the school districts with ours and ask for unanimous consent. Any objection? Mr. <laughs> Harold Hanscom. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Smith, Ms. Wall, and Ms. Hughes-Candies, and then I'll speak. Mr. Smith. Uh, Ms. Wall. Um, I'm, uh, will object just because this makes it more complicated, um, for staff, but I do agree with Mr. Kelly and I'll be objecting to the original motion, um, for the same reasons. Uh, Ms. Hughes-Candies. I don't, thanks, Madam Mayor. Yeah, I think we go three or we go one. Those are the only options that make sense to me. Um, if uh, Bartlett wants to go this way, when and I objected when they wanted to go the other way before because it was seemed rash and wasn't well reasoned by leadership and it was in the middle of a cycle. Um, and I'm fine tying our enterprises' hands behind their back when we think that's the best thing for them to do because that is the way our city is set up. So uh, in this case, so I think it, it's fine to give them the tools that they want. If school board's happy for that, I do think it'll incur extra cost for them. And then I think we will just have to leave those where they are and hope that they're not major extra costs. But if that's the way they want to go, then they'll know that they're incurring extra costs. So. I'm fine with three, and I'm going to object to this because it complicates. Thank you. Um, I'm going to object um, if the hospital wants to have their own auditing for specialized funding. I think we've all lived through enough of the school district financing that we should probably have a special audit for them also. So I'm going to object to putting this. Um, CBJ and the school together. So, Mr. Kelly, it's up to you. You have three objections. Do you want to do a vote or do you want to remove your motion? 
I guess I'll go ahead and uh, withdraw my motion. All right, thank you for that. So we're back to the main motion. Any objection to that? Madam Mayor, if in case there's a super government uh, enthusiast listing online, we said three, four earlier, and maybe we didn't explain, and we've had a lot of withdrawn motions. So if anyone in radio land is wondering, it's because a four or three vote would not pass. So these objections are just saving us time, or these removed uh, motions are just saving us time from calling the vote. Thank you for stating that. Uh, Ms. hughes Scanny is correct. We do not go by a majority. We need to have five. And there's only seven of us tonight. So if three of us say no, it's not gonna go further. So um, back to the main motion. Ms. Adkison, will you raise your hand? Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, my reasons for objecting are have already been said. I'm concerned about staff time and also with the school district being what it is and the uncertainty of funding from the state in the future, I am hesitant to have um, them incur additional expenses. Okay, Ms. Hale. Go ahead. You're going to speak to your motion. I, I, I am going to speak to my motion. I, I, I don't know that I can emphasize enough the the um, the <laughs> I, I really worry that we're trying to save pennies um, in and we're going to lose literally millions by doing that. Um, the importance the importance of having that specialized audit um, to to look very deeply into these very specialized financing fields. Um, it, I, I just don't think we can overstate it. And it's not going to cost enormously more. It's just going to cost something more, and we don't know exactly what it is. Um, so I, I, will, I will be sad if this does not pass. Um, I'll comment also. Um, you have to remember with the audit, they not only turn over all the rocks and everything, they also can give advice when they do that. And I think the advice is probably as valuable as any cost, however small it may be. So I think that's what the hospital is looking for and that's what the school district will, would be looking for if they were sitting in this room, but they're not tonight. So I would support this motion. So we have a motion on the floor and objection. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll? Thank you, Madam Mayor. On the motion to propose the Assembly Finance Committee direct staff to solicit three scopes of work for the audit RFP, one for the hospital, one for the school district, and one for the City and Bureau of Juno. Assembly Member Hale. Yes. Assembly Member Atkinson. No. Assembly Member Hugh Scandies. Yes. Assembly Member Smith. Yes. Assembly Member Kelly. No. Assembly Member Wall. No. Mayor Walden. Yes. Motion fails for A's, three nays. Can I ask for a reconsideration? Do you want immediate reconsideration? Imme or? Immediate reconsideration. Okay, let's uh, take a moment and figure this one out. <laughs> All right, we're not taking a break. We're not taking a break. Come on back. <laughs> Okay, so I'm looking at my chart and to get an immediate reconsideration, we need six votes. So um, with that being said. Um, Can I speak to my motion? I'm sorry? Can I speak to my motion? Um, let me see. Oh, yeah. Does not say that, but it uh, isn't. Oh, it is debatable. Go ahead. Go ahead and speak. <laughs> um, I, I just, you know, we're, I'm trying my best to count here and didn't know how everyone was going to vote on that. I 
you know, I would prefer to go with uh, one, but I see that the majority of the room, that that motion will fail too, and the majority of the room wants to move forward with three, and so I'm perfectly happy to reconsider this, vote again, and vote in support so that it um, will pass. So we would need, sounds like we would need six votes to be able to do that. So I'm hoping I can convince the others to, to try that again, if I'm following correctly. I think you are without an attorney in the room. Um, so Ms. Wall has made a motion to, for immediate reconsideration. Do we have objection? We do not. So the previous vote is null and void and we will vote again, Ms. Wendell. <laughs> on the motion to propose the Assembly Finance Committee direct staff to solicit three scopes of work for the audit RFP, one for the hospital, one for the school district, and one for the city and borough of Juneau. Assembly Member Hale. Before we go, I should ask, is there any objection? Seeing none, that motion passes. I believe we are done with the hospital for the <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for being here tonight. <laughs> uh, looking at looking looking at the body, do we need a little break? Yeah, let's Okay, let's let's come back at ten after.
synopsis was correct. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. So anyway, now we're going to request for a civic engagement and communication strategy. Did we lose Ms. Wall? Ms. Wall is still online. Oh, well, there we are. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> what's your name again? Madam City Manager. <laughs> uh, so you have before you a memo that just provides some context to an ordinance that was introduced at uh, your last assembly meeting to um, spend some $50,000 on a civic engagement and communication strategy. And I list a bunch of objectives of this strategy. I do think that it's a uh, it's quite bold. I mean, I think that um, my ambition to kind of communicate more and in diverse ways and with new constituencies and meet people where they're at and figure out how to uh, effectively, you know, manage your boroughassembly.gov account um, could require an entire new uh, department. So part of this communication strategy is to identify uh, the staff that we do have do an audit of our communications, identify what we are doing with uh, communications, what we are doing effectively, and um, some of those gaps and some of the resource needs that we would need to fill those gaps. So I just would foreshadow that my intention would be to um, issue this RFP for a communications and civic engagement strategy, and from that uh, have a budget request for um, the FY26 budget. The funding source, um, the ordinance was introduced with funding from the uh, fund balance. Um, however, I also proposed deappropriating $50,000 that, that would kind of make that neutral from uh, a CIP project called uh, Hut to Hut. And while uh, Hut to Hut and civic engagement um, and communication strategy, the only thing they have in common is they're both city manager uh, pet projects because that was a, pro a project that city manager Watt had uh, initiated and it just never um, got speed. <laughs> Stop talking. I got the hook. No, I said, no, I said you killed it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, it's a little unclear, Madam Manager, what you need from us tonight because we're not quite sure what you're I think I you're right. I don't I don't think I need anything. Mostly I just wanted uh, this to come to a committee before it was introduced and because that committee was um, canceled. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to give me feedback on uh, on the proposal. Our normal process would be for it to go to a committee before it is introduced, and it, it didn't get to do that. So, just give me some feedback. Any questions for Madam Manager, Ms. Hughes Candies? Feedback. Go ahead. Thanks, Madam Mayor. I like the, uh, I've talked with you about needing better communication, so I'm excited about the prospect of having better communication. I like uh, several of the things that I see in here, especially having it to be easy to follow things, having it be easy to find stuff on the website, because those could use a lot of work. Um, so I have a couple of pet favorites there. I would hope that also it's not really spelled out so much, but we talked in the past about how like our planning commission notices are, you know, legalese essentially. So if you get that, you don't know what to do with it. And I'm sure there are other things you could get from the city that I, I don't know what to do with this. You know, I don't know why I'm getting it. So I would hope we would look at sort of all those sorts of things of what are the official notices we send out and can we make them just readable to the average bear where we don't feel like anyone's not going to be sure who this is coming from. Because I can imagine to a certain extent you could get a very official document and think, am I in trouble? Is this who is this really coming from? No, it's just your city, and here's why you're getting it. Anybody else? Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you. Um, I might double dip with both a comment and a question, if I may. Just this one time. Okay. Make it thank quick. You. <laughs> um, I, I, and actually, I think uh, I think Miss Hughes Gandhi's kind of um, said a lot of what I what I intended to see. Like, I, I think. One of the things I'd like to see, of course, you know, the website, better communication, better outreach. Um, 
I guess my question is, um, do we see this fifty thousand dollars as as the start? Like, are we is this fifty thousand dollars meant to study how we can improve, or is it meant to implement improvements? Madam Manager, uh, this fifty thousand dollars would would just study how we can improve and provide a strategy that I'd be able to bring to you for implementation. Thank you. Ms. Wall. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just curious about um, staff reaction to the SRC um, comments here. I think they're good ones. They're really kind of operational in, you know, details that we at the assembly level may not get out there but but i do think it's some you know i think we all talk about the fact that the reality is there are you know a few hundred people who really know how to maybe at best interact with us and follow the process and those who don't are often in our more marginalized communities and so just curious you know what um what your reaction to to you know incorporating that that lens um into this project Madam Manager is taking notes, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's a driving force for our, um, I say our because uh, my leadership team has really talked about this a lot and the disproportionate voice, people who know how to use the system, have the time to use the system can provide. And so when we talk about new ideas and strategies to engage the public and diversify who we hear from, um, that would, would be probably, I think that's a driving goal of this, uh, this strategy. Anything further, Ms. Hale? Thank you. And this is a comment and not a question. Um, I, this makes me really happy to see this. And Madam Manager, thank you so much. It's so important to our communication, which is not working very well. Um, it's very, very fractured. And I, I think this is just trying to figure out how to move forward and communicate better and more effectively with community members is really critical. I think it will help uh, people understand government better. It will help it will help make more sense of what's happening in the community so people aren't shocked when something happens. So I, I just have great appreciation to you for making this happen and moving it forward. So thank you. Ms. Hughes Candies. Thanks, Madam Mayor. I just remembered one other tiny one, which is social media. My hope with that is because this is just a plan at this point. I think uh, let's just be very mindful of how we use it because I've seen plenty of examples of uh, departments down south or elsewhere, like perhaps using it in an attempt to get people's attention, but in a way that I think is uh, maybe crossing a line that government shouldn't. Uh, for instance, humor is very easy to read many different ways. There's like a lot of good examples of uh, um, funny police departments or funny fire departments and frequently what's seen as like good natured, you know, for somebody else crosses the line. So that's all. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, on that, um, I definitely think we should be on TikTok. <laughs> I'm getting everybody shaking their head, Mr. Smith, so I don't know if she should write that down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ms. Atkinson, do you want to speak to that? As the youngest person in this room, and I guess the only one that uses TikTok, absolutely not. Thank you very much. Anyway, we're, well, we're uh, going around. I think um, Madam Andrew has some good ideas. Um, I too would support um, doing something with our website, even at the expense of Rory Watts' pet project, <laughs> Hut to Hut. So, but I think the discussion at this time has ended unless you need something further from us. Okay, moving on. Next, we have the St. Vincent de Paul grant. Who's speaking to that? Mr. Barr. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this one probably can be short and sweet. So St. Vincent de Paul uh, had some turnover among their finance staff. 
um, they were not able to apply on time for a property tax exemption that they would typically be eligible for. Um, we don't have the authority to grant that exception on the staff side, which is why you're seeing this ordinance in front of you um, to grant them the exemption that they would have been eligible for had they applied timely. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Madam Deputy Mayor, it's Kaylee. You could go with Madam Hale, I'm fine with that. <laughs> I move ordinance uh, number 2024-01BJ uh, for the 35,025 grant to St. Vincent de Paul to the assembly for introduction. And I ask for unanimous consent. Any objection? Oh, Ms. Flick raised her Ms. hand. Flick. Oh, this actually has already been introduced. It was introduced um, in August. It'll be up for public hearing on the 16th. So you don't need a motion at all? I don't believe we need a motion unless you want to um, Move it stop it in its track. I removed that motion. Okay, any, Ms. Hughes-Gannies. Uh, thanks, I just have a question on this one. So we get, is there a reason they can't do the write a letter and say they're late in the way that individuals do? And I'm seeing nods. Mr. Barr. Um, well, Ms. Flick can correct me. We probably should have just gone straight to her, but my understanding, uh, my, my belief is that the letter process is for individuals only, not for uh, nonprofit organizations. Okay, perfect. So when we say it didn't meet the strict legal criteria, we only mean time. Okay, thank you. That's great. And we have done something for this for the Glory Hall before, too, because it's the same. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks. They pay us and we pay them back. <laughs> okay. Anything further other than our next meeting date is September 18th at 6 p.m., not 5.30, 6 p.m. because of the elections going on. September 18th. The election staff will be here until 6 is what I was told. I'm looking at Ms. Flick and she is nodding her head. Uh, the election um, staff, I believe, will uh, close down the voting center 515 or, or 5. They just need a moment to um, correctly close down the room so it can be available for public use. So that's just a reminder to people that the voting center will be in the assembly chambers until October 1st. Anything else before the finance committee? Ms. Wall, as chair, do you have anything else before the committee? Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you for everybody's patience. <laughs>